Hi all, I just wanted to do another video here and actually I was uh, kind of surprised this week. Um, you know, I've been looking for uh, news items that were very uh, biblically related and not chasing the headlines. And as part of that, I think about a week or a little bit more ago, uh, I was looking at the uh, trouble in Damascus and knowing that uh, Isaiah 17, uh, Jeremiah 49, um, were definitely related to Syria and Damascus in particular. Um, I was drilling in on that, and I think you all know that I also found in the Nets version of the Septuagint another re reference to the destruction of Damascus and uh, in Zephaniah 2. And when we were walking through Zephaniah 2, it sort of stuck out to me that... Um, there was a, a reference to the rapture at the beginning of Zephaniah 2 and that the rest of Zephaniah 2 related to Psalm 83. And so um, I had previously pointed to the fact that uh, Bible scholar Bill Solace had uh, frequently talked about uh, how Isaiah 17 might be related to uh, Psalm 83, but he didn't have scriptural proof and we sort of pointed to that and said well the rapture reference in that same Zephaniah 2 was first in the chapter and I just postulated does that mean the rapture occurs sequentially before the Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17 war well there was no proof to that it was just intriguing but the strange thing is is that rapture reference um, kind of started something and um, prior in the video series one of the commenters on these videos was pushing me a little bit to say do you think the rapture happens on one of the feasts and then if so which one Pentecost or Feast of Trumpets are the two that almost everybody that looks into the feast uh, tries to pin the rapture to and and I went very neutral in this video series. And again, if you're just seeing this video and you haven't looked at my channel, the channel is If Lord Willing. And it's basically a prophecy uh, Bible study channel. And then uh, this video is going to be down in the uh, news um, playlist or series. And um, I'm putting this out here today because we're on the eve of uh, Pentecost. And um, I don't have all my ducks pulled together. Usually I like to have uh, the plan in my head of what I want to describe and, and what I believe the, the passages are telling me. And this one I don't feel quite as ready to do. But since I, people were pushing on the channel a little bit to, to talk about the different feasts and the rapture, I thought, well, why not go dig in one more time and see if I can't figure out more than I have in the past and I'll tell you every time I've looked at this in the past I get split right down the middle between you could reason for Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets being the rapture and you look at things like the last trump you look at things like nobody knows the hour of the day being an idiom uh, that people apply to that feast there are several things you can look at that make you can make the argument for that raptures on uh, Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets. And the second one I talked about was Pentecost. And the angle on people that look at Pentecost usually is the same. It has to do with the harvest cycles. And um, I started there. I thought, well, if I'm going to go take a look at um, Pentecost since it was coming up, uh, I started digging in. And, and I don't have this all raked together in a pile that uh, I can describe very well, but I'm just going to show you some things. And then uh, what I usually do is I just sort of hang on to them loosely. And if I see a bunch of contradictory stuff later, um, you know, I lose the train of thought and I, I take the more strong arguments. And so right now I'm going to present a bunch of things that I'm holding on to fairly loosely. But I just think it's really interesting, and given we're on the eve of Pentecost, what better time to do the the uh, video on the rapture with the Feast of Pentecost. So uh, as I was digging in, um, I found an article. It's a 22-page article, the threefold order and we just of the resurrection of the righteous. 
and this was done by a gentleman named Pastor Jack uh, Langford. And um, generally, I like to read a whole bunch of stuff by an author, even if they're credentialed, to get a comfort level that that is just not a bunch of internet stuff. And I got reading on some of this Jack Langford stuff, and um, I'm pretty comfortable with it. His website uh, was separationtruth.com. But again, I'd have to say I've, I've only read this 22-page article and a few brief excerpts from his website. And so I, I reserve being able to go back and, and say oh, I've got a problem with it. But this is a very well-defended argument that he makes here, very scripturally based, and he, and he uh, backs up his points very well. I get the sense he's a very serious Bible scholar. He actually may also have recently passed away. I was trying to find his credentials, and the only reference to him that I could find was somebody that had a massive stroke and possibly passed away. So our prayers for the Langford family, if that's the case. And maybe this video can honor him a little bit if, that, if that's what happened. So he's got the threefold order of the resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous, and he sees it in 1 Corinthians 15. And so let's go down to the bottom so we don't have to deal with the 22 pages. Look at the summary argument he makes. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15, read it for ourselves, and I'll try and make some comments based on the article, and then we'll go from there and take a look at some really interesting other things that I found this week. So let's scroll down. Um, I think I need to get to page 19, actually. Okay, hang with me here. There it is. There it is. And let's shrink it up a little bit here so we can read them. Hope that's not too small. Um, so here's a s summary, and I guess we'll just, we'll go with the summary, and then uh, we'll flip into the actual verses. So... Uh, were I to summarize this Bible study in an abbreviated manner, I would do so by the following outline statement. First, the wave offering of the first fruits at the Feast of Unleavened Bread symbolizes the resurrection and ascension of Christ, the first fruits of the dead in resurrection. The second, the wave offering of the two loaves of bread at the Feast of Pentecost symbolize the resurrection and ascension of the church, the first fruits harvest. They that are Christ's. Third, the final ingathering of harvest at the end of the year, Feast of Tabernacles, symbolizes the resurrection of the Old Testament and tribulation saints. The harvest and the gleanings at the end, death is abolished. Okay, I don't know if uh, a lot of that stuck with you. Go, let's go look at the passage puts in the order, and this is what his argument is in 1 Corinthians 15, these three resurrections are talked about in their order, and then we'll make some comment. Okay, so let's start with this 1 Corinthians 15 reference. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man came uh, come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in its own order. Okay, here's, we've got to be careful. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So this is the rapture reference. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjugation under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjugation, it is plain that he has accepted who put all things in subjugation under him. When? Just a minute all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjugation under him, that God may be all in all. 
Okay, let's break this down just a little bit with the insight that the article gave us. And then we'll make some other comments. So uh, first, the article made the point that Christ is seen as the first fruits of this resurrection ordering. And it's talked about twice here. And so he makes quite a point of that. Um, the second thing that he makes quite a point of, and he pauses in his article right about here, and he talks about the fact that this whole ordering is resurrection unto Christ. Um, because we'll see the third resurrection, um, most people associate the these passages with the end of the millennium. He's going to argue for that that resurrection is the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints right at the kickoff of the millennium. And so it's it's a new thought for me, but this whole thing becomes really intriguing here in a minute. So let's come down here. Um, so he says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So you have to be in Christ here is the criteria to be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruit, and here he's repeating that. Then, so after that, at his coming, well, the, this coming, if we're talking about resurrections, has got to be the rapture, those who belong to Christ. Then after that comes the end, um, when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father. And so these passages after here talk about Christ setting up his rule over the earth and then handing, basically, he, he resubmits himself to God the Father after he's put down all the enemies and become ruler of the world. And it makes perfect sense if you say, well, um, doesn't that happen during the thousand years that he's reigning and then finally he's put down everything after the last rebellion of Satan and then he turns over everything to God the Father and what um, this Mr. Langford is talking about is the end reference is the the uh, end of the dispensation when uh, the tribulation is complete and um, what's being set up is the next dispensation which is the millennial reign and he kind of proves this by if um, all these have to be dead in Christ he pointed to the Rev Revelation 20 um, reference let me see if I can figure this out quick uh, Revelation 24 uh, is the resurrection of the tribulation saints and his argument is basically in that passage there's a statement about that with with their resurrection uh, the first resurrection is complete and then they talk about how the dead in Christ or the one no, the uh, ones that never accepted Christ are part of the second death after that and so long story short these three resurrections that are mentioned here are you all have to be in Christ and so he, it's uh, first Christ when he was raised and if you remember I think it was in Matthew there was a small resurrection of some saints at the same time and now to tie to the harvest um, we'll see that that is like the wave offering of the barley harvest at um, um, at the feast that most people call Feast of First Fruits. And then the second uh, resurrection here is the church um, in the rapture. And that will tie up to the first fruit um uh, offering at Pentecost of the wheat harvest. Then the third one here is the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints because they're still in Christ, remember. And what he's going to tie it to is a third harvest that we hardly ever talk about, which is the feast of the ingathering 
which is the harvest of the nuts and the fruits of the trees and the gleanings from from the grain harvest and so really interesting because i never saw this uh in this way before and i still kind of you know i reserve some things in the back of my head saying well um i still have questions like i get how this whole passage then in context is referencing resurrections of of those that were in christ it's really different thinking for me to say that then um, this notion of Christ putting down all of his enemies and the father basically putting his enemies under his feet and then Jesus handing the kingdom back over to the father as not being at the end of the millennium. The argument is, no, it's it's as Christ is setting up his rule, um, he's taking all the nations that uh, had come against him and and basically he's putting down those uh, nations and now is there scriptural support for this thought and I, uh, yes definitely the article pointed to daniel 2 how uh, the stone that was cut without hands became a great mountain that filled the whole earth well we know that the millennial reign is jesus reigning over the entire earth and so if you want to say putting down all the enemies happens in the first uh, 75 day gap that people talk about after um, Armageddon till the setup of the millennial reign boy that kind of fits together and makes sense and so I hope you kind of follow me on that let's go look at a definition of these harvest cycles let's take a look at the three harvests again hopefully we cement the thought and then I want to show you one other really kind of neat thing that happened to me this week okay so here's a website and I didn't put a lot of uh, due diligence into finding there's so many websites that lifts the harvest I just go find one that seems uh, reasonable <laughs> and I just wanted to find a small chart and that's exactly what we have here so here we've got the festival what season time it's in and then the the biblical reference and and so um, PSOC uh, the end of winter, start of spring. Um, this is when they do the, the barley harvest, right? And so um, this generates then that wave offering. And now the prior article I mentioned said, well, the whole period of time from Passover to this first fruits wave offering, and actually for seven full days actually after Passover, it is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And his argument is that the wave offering isn't really a feast. It's actually just a uh, an event um, after the day after the Sabbath that occurs. But regardless, the part that we're interested in is, is it's this wave offering that's done with the first group of barley that's become ripe. And why is that interesting? It's because that's what's called the first fruit of Christ that we looked at in the uh, prior passage here. Let's just go back so I don't lose anybody. Um, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay, so when they talk about the first fruits, they're talking about the first fruit barley harvest that happens here during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and it happens on the day after the Sabbath, after um, Passover. And so that's how that works. Now, what's interesting is this, it's a bundle of barley, and the priest holds it up, and it's, uh, this article I was making reference to said that that waving it up over your head is symbolism for the resurrection. And so it was Jesus at his resurrection with the uh, handful of, um, saints that were that came out of the graves at the same time Jesus was resurrected now we come down to Shavuot and I apologize they're using the German or the <laughs> Jewish terminology for these feasts but this would be the feast of weeks also known as Pentecost okay and there's a special offering during this feast which is the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the wheat harvest is the big harvest, and it's also wheat was more desired 
actually than the bar barley harvest but long story short with this is when this harvest occurred and the first fruits came in it the flour that was made from this first bunch of wheat was really really finely um, filtered and processed and whatever and then a big lump of dough was made and from that one lump of dough two uh, two loaves of bread were created and baked and then uh, the symbolism that people say there as well the two loaves out of one lump is showing the the increase that the Lord is giving um, the fact that there was yeast allowed in this bread shows that it was sinners that were being redeemed and then you get people saying the fact that the this was baked bread that's the tribulation that comes on every believer during their lifetime that God uses to mature us Okay, so those are all great little symbolisms. And then the priest holds these again up over his head. And again, it's another picture of, of, a, of a resurrection. And so you have Christ's resurrection, the first fruits of the barley harvest. Then the argument is you have the rapture of the church at the first fruits uh, harvest of the wheat harvest, which would be at Pentecost, okay? And then the last one is the ingathering harvest, where you um, gather in, it keeps using corn here for the produce that's being gathered, but in reality, it's the nuts from the trees and the fruits from the trees. And this is um, the end of summer, start of autumn. And it actually, uh, this, this harvest feast is the same as the one that they call the Feast of Tabernacles. And so I know this is confusing because there's multiple names for all of these feasts. You got Feast of Tabernacles also being called the Feast of Ingathering. You got Shavuot also being called Pentecost. Um, and you got, uh, we talked about the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. <laughs> and so I know that's difficult, but we, the argument from the article was three resurrections that they're ordered and that they fit those uh, resurrections starting with Christ at the harvest times. And so if Christ was resurrected at the first fruits of the barley, the church getting resurrected here at Pentecost or Shavuot, um, represented by the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and then the tribulation saints and the Old Testament saints being resurrected at the Feast of the Ingathering. So there's there's the argument in terms of the feasts and the and there's nothing really that I would argue with any of this. It's just different thinking to say um, that that uh, this third harvest, the uh, Ingathering harvest, then comes with the rest of the activity that happens here, which people, including me, tend to put at the end of the millennium, which is Jesus setting up his reign, putting down all of his enemies, and then handing over the kingdom to God. The implication is this is happening all in the first, say, 75 days after uh, Armageddon when Jesus returns in the second coming versus taking him the full thousand years and having Satan thrown in the lake of fire before he turns us back over to the Father. So that's the only part that, um, you know, I just, I put it out as a question, but boy, the argument for the three resurrections being tied to the three feasts is starting to make a lot of sense. Um, the third thing that was pointed out in the article that's related to all this is that there was three feast periods when all the Jews were expected to come back to Jerusalem to worship at the temple and guess which three feasts it were, the this exact same three that we were studying. And so again, it's a picture of the people being rejoined with God and <laughs> it gives you one more sort of symbolic connection that this could be a good interpretation of these feast, feasts. So that was really powerful. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit to something that fits it's, fits in with all this, but it came about in a totally different way. So just hang on and we'll get to that. Okay, you're looking at an email I did here. And again, I think I did this email almost 
maybe a week ago. Um, it's right as I decided I would start looking at these feasts again as part of trying to figure out whether the uh, Pentecost rapture argument was stronger than the Feast of Trumpets or the other way around. And as I was digging, I found um, a book that was online, or at least a chapter of a book that was online from this uh, doctor, and I'll probably screw this up, Bakiochi or Bakchiachi. Um, he did have a, uh, if you go, if you want to put this into a Google search, you'll find him. He did have a quite the long and distinguished uh, set of credentials, and he had uh, written this book, God's Festivals in Scripture and History, Volume 2, The Fall Festivals, and in chapter two, which was titled The Feast of Trumpets, he wrote, and then um, I quoted him, and basically he was showing some things relating to the Feast of Trumpets, and he picked on the verse how the trumpet sound will be herald Christ from heaven, and this he references First Thessalonians 4, which is sort of the classic um, rapture text, right? And so in my email to him, I was telling him I was just trying to understand these feasts better, and I ran into his book online, got into this chapter on uh, the Feast of Trumpets. Again, I was trying to figure out, does the rapture fit closer to that or closer to Pentecost? I had a Pentecost, well, I was to have a Pentecost article. I hadn't had it at the point I wrote this email. But um, his first argument up here sort of seems to lead you to believe that um, he could be saying Feast of Trumpets shows this affinity with the rapture, and he makes some comments, the last trump, and he, again, he points to this 1 Corinthians 15 rapture passage, and um, that sort of all made sense to me because I'd heard that argument a bunch before. But then he he got into uh, harvest, or he got into other analysis, and then he did, he sort of started to make a different argument down lower. And let me read lower in this chapter two of his book. Uh, I noticed this paragraph and it seemed to be interesting. Um, he was talking about how um, the Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets had this characteristic. It's a day of judgment. In the rabbinical tradition, the Feast of Trumpets is clearly seen as a day of judgment. The central motif of Rosh Hashanah is that of a day of judgment. On this day, says tradition, all who enter the world pass before the heavenly judge like troops in review or like sheep beneath the shepherd's crook. God opens his great book of records, the fate of each according uh, to his Desert, uh oh, who is to live and who is to die, who to rest and who to rove, who to grow rich and who to grow poor. Okay, and then um, I thought, wow, I had, this passing beneath the shepherd's crook I had heard of before, and uh, if this ties to Rosh Hashanah, it was making my wheels spin because. If we go back, and if you remember from my prior slides, um, let me just see if I can pop that up quick without messing this up. We have uh, believers only entering the uh, Messianic uh, uh, kingdom here. And the picture of the Jewish one, my argument is Ezekiel 20, verses 33 to 43, where basically the Jewish people had been regathered into the wilderness, and then the reference is that they need to pass under the rod and uh, sort of get separated as they leave the sheepfold. And then um, there's what's called the sheep and goat judgment in Matthew 25. And it, the sheep and goat judgment says it's of the nations, which typically is a reference to the Gentiles. And so my argument was the, the millennium kicks off with believers only and these are not resurrected people these are the ones that survived the horrible seven-year tribulation okay and so let's pop back now with with that little bit of context <clears throat> and read as this is read this ezekiel 20 for the jewish people 
as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me, and I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Okay, so that sounded so much to me like this historical account of the purpose for Rosh Hashanah, um, a day of judgment. And um, we talk about uh, that the heavenly judge like troops in review or sheep beneath the shepherd's crook. To me, that was like, bam, that's exactly right. And it also sounded a little bit like the sheep and goat judgment. And so the reason why this is important if we want to make the argument that Pentecost represents the rapture of the church, what do you do with the remaining feasts of the year? You've got the next one after Pentecost is this Rosh Hashanah or Feast of Trumpets. Uh, and then the one after that is Yom Kippur. And the final one is Tabernacles. And um, let me just lay out the scenario of the dots that I'm connecting here. If we say, look to the harvest cycle and the feasts in, uh, for the resurrections that we reviewed, the barley wave um, of after Christ's resurrection, the symbolism of Christ's re resurrection, um, the, the sheaf of the barley being waved by the priest, being for Christ, we say Pentecost, then for the first fruits wave offering of the two loaves during uh, Pentecost, and then the Old Testament saints and the um, uh, tribulation saints being resurrected as being the feast of ingathering, that all works pretty good. And um, so, the, that last feast of ingathering, that resurrection's right here. Then if we go back and we say, well, now what do you do if that the last feast there represented the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, which is also called the Feast of Ingathering, what do you do with Rosh Hashanah? And boy, we just saw from that email that the Jewish uh, belief as to what, what characterizes Rosh Hashanah is judgment passing beneath the shepherd's staff. That matches exactly what we've got in uh, this review right here where you get the believers only entering the Messianic kingdom. The only thing in my mind, and again, I'm still just processing this, now where do you put Yom Kippur? And Yom Kippur... Um, is the final sealing of the fate of people. And when I read this chapter two of um, this doctor's book, um, he, makes the, he makes the argument that um, Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment. And a lot of people would talk more about Yom Kippur that way. But he says Rosh Hashanah for the Jewish people was the day of judgment and that they had 10 days of repentance then and judgment was sealed uh, 10 days later on Yom Kippur. So I don't know what to do with Yom Kippur and our little model here. If we say Pentecost really represents the rapture of the church and if we can be okay with the next feast being Rosh Hashanah and that representing um, this passing beneath the rod of both the Gentiles and the and the Jews um, that takes care of that. Then we've got ten days and we've hit Yom Kippur. It didn't really solve that, but then we have the last feast of the year, which we tied to the harvest cycle. Um, this uh, feast of ingathering, which is also called Feast of Tabernacles. And so I guess, given the limited information I've got and the time I've spent studying this, I would just say perhaps what's going to happen is, let me pop up our chart here, is that the judgment is made on Rosh Hashanah. 
in terms of you know passing beneath Jesus on the throne and having him separate out the sheep and the goats in terms of the uh, of the Gentile believers and for the Jewish believers it's a similar process they pass beneath the rod of his staff um, does Jesus give people 10 more days of repentance before their destiny is sealed that's the only thing I can think of that would tie up them with Yom Kippur is that Jesus gives them one last chance after they know which way they're headed to repent um, that's all I can make of that and then the very last thing we've got after that is the uh, feast of in gathering in terms of the harvest cycle which is represented by this resurrection here and it's also the feast of tabernacles where God lives with and dwells with his people for a thousand years so isn't that kind of cool I think um, I appreciate the people on my YouTube channel that sort of pushed me to dig into this one more time I know I didn't have all the facts completely nailed down and I just basically laid out uh, another scenario but it's so much more of a plausible scenario now that I've been through the exercise I'm not saying I think the rapture is Pentecost, this Pentecost, or any other, but I'm saying it's a lot more probable than I guess I, I would have thought going into this, and I really appreciate uh, getting the feedback and being pushed a little bit to get into this and try and figure it out, because I think the story is way more credible. And for anybody that was curious, no, I did not get a response to my email, but... Um, I almost don't need one now because um, having potentially reconciled how the feasts line up um, with the different resurrections, it sort of reinforced then this second part of uh, what is Rosh Hashanah then. And I think it's passing beneath the rod. It's this judgment that occurs right here. And uh, so... I think I'll leave it right there, and I really appreciate feedback. Again, um, I don't want to spread anything false, but it just I got pretty fired up by this one. So I appreciate feedback, and if I need to clarify something, let me know. Thanks.